Hi, everyone. Welcome to the CCPA webinar with PubMatic. Uh, in today's webinar, we'll talk through what CCPA means for publishers. And with that, I'll give you uh, an overview of what we're going to talk through today. So first, I'll have an introduction of all the speakers. Second, we'll have level set on what is CCPA and make sure we're all working from the same shared understanding. We'll then go through some of the legal implications of CCPA and then follow up with a technical walkthrough of how to work towards compliance technically. We'll end with consent management platform viewpoint on CCPA and then leave some time at the end for questions and answers. So with that, a brief introduction of all of your speakers today. Speaking is Marina Gu. I'm Senior Director of Customer Enablement at Pomatic. We've got Thomas Chow, our Chief Legal Officer, and Ash Vemulapali, our Senior Product Manager, uh, who oversees all inventory quality and ad quality compliance. And we also have a guest speaker, Jawad Stooley, Chief Technology Officer at Didomi. Before we go into the content of the webinar, I'd like to take a brief poll. Uh, and you'll notice that in the webinar software, the slides that I'll share with the poll are actually interactive. And so you'll select the answer in there. Our first question is, a, is an easy one. What's your comfort level with CCPA? And you can rate this on a scale of high, medium, or low. Uh, and like I mentioned, you can select um, in what looks like the slide itself, and then hit submit. And I'll give everyone a few seconds to do that right now. Perfect. Uh, last warning, I'm going to move over to the next poll. We've got one more question here before we get started. How many um, have you have made any changes to your business, whether technical or strategic, in response to CCPA? So just two answers here. Yes, I have made changes to my business, or no, I haven't made any changes to my business. And same thing here. Select one of the circles and then hit submit. And I'll give you a few more seconds to do that. Perfect. So we'll come back to those uh, responses in a minute. So what is CCPA? Like I said before, let's start with the basics to make sure we're working from a shared understanding, and then we can go into more specifics on the legal and technical walkthrough. So the background, what is CCPA? Well, first off, it stands for California Consumer Protection Act. And like Europe's GDPR, the CCPA law provides consumers with an option to request that companies not sell their personal information and actually provides copies or uh, the ability to delete that personal information. So why does it matter to publishers? Similar to GDPR, the fines can be pretty severe. Um, on a per record or per user basis, the penalty could be as much as $7,500 for any intentional violations of the law. And even if you're lacking intent of violating the law, the penalty could still be $2,500 per record or per user. So on a, given that's on a per record or per user base, it's, it's a pretty steep fine. Uh, so, you know, certainly something to pay attention to and, and understand and see how you want to adjust your business to work towards compliance. And how can Pubmatic help? Well, Pubmatic currently supports the U.S. privacy string to strip out um, the user request as appropriate. And Ash from our product team will walk us through that in greater detail uh, later on in the webinar today. So taking a step back and thinking about consumer privacy broadly and, and how this plays into that. You know, historically, during registration signups for any online account, a consumer just had to check a few boxes uh, and leave it at that. And CCPA changes that flow. 
The most widespread solution we've seen for CCPA participants, is, participating companies, excuse me, is to add user controls in that registration sign up. Uh, and they may have something like do not sell my personal information button. And these user controls also tend to allow users to select which parties their information is actually disclosed to. Now, some companies may give all U US users the same opt out and deletion rights they give to Californians simply because that's easier to control and set up on their side as opposed to trying to identify only Californian um, residents. So that gives us the overview of CCPA. Now, going back to our poll question, what's your comfort level with CCPA? Now, uh, an overwhelming majority of you said medium, which you know certainly makes sense. There's been some in the news, but it's it's hard to digest and understand exactly what uh, what vantage point to say take um, for how to be in compliance with the law. Um, so you know, hopefully, this webinar will um, will help. Uh, clarify how to think about CCPA and and how to work towards compliance for your business, um, and you know hopefully still valuable for uh, the small small part of you that actually have a high level of knowledge. Have you made any changes to your business, whether technical or strategic, in response to CCPA? So a majority of you have already made changes, um, and you know still meaningful part about a quarter of you haven't made any changes. Um, so whether you've already implemented some changes and want to see if that's the full set, or you haven't and you want to figure out what that looks like, um, either way, I imagine that the technical walkthrough and the consent management platform um, parts of the presentation, as well as the legal implications, will you know, all help you figure out how to, how to move forward from here. So with that, let me hand it off to Thomas Chow, who will walk through the legal implications of CCPA. Great, thank you, Marina, for that introduction. Before I kick off, I wanna start by saying that the CCPA is a very comprehensive statute that covers data protection and privacy. So I'm only gonna have time to focus some of them on some of the more important implications for privacy for personalized advertising for both advertisers and publishers. So starting off with publishers, as I know most folks on this call are, here are some of the highlights for you. First, I think it's important to understand what transfers of personal data may constitute a sale of personal information. While I certainly advise everyone to work with their own privacy counsel or law firm on these issues, this is really the crux of the data provisions within the CCPA. Everything that you do with data when you transfer it to a third party will either be classified as a sale or not. And you need to have a really strong understanding of this, which also comes from doing a data protection impact assessment in the first place. Second, I believe that any publisher who plans to continue to do behavioral, behavioral or personalized advertising needs to add a do not sell my information button to their website for all California consumers. Other opt-out mechanisms are permissible, but the best form is still a do not sell button. Why is that? First, that's actually what the statute says. It says that everyone should have a do not sell my information button on their website. And unlike the GDPR, which requires consent or is an opt-in regime, the CCPA is an opt-out regime. There have been some attorneys and business folks who've branded that do not sell my information button as a button of quote unquote shame. I think that's wrong. And unfortunately, I don't think it reflects an accurate understanding of how most publishers, not to mention most tech companies, use data in the first place. Third, in conjunction with that do not sell my information button, implement a consent management platform. That do not sell my information button doesn't help you very much if you're ever audited or investigated by the attorney general's office you need to find a way to log your opt-outs. Now, implementing a CMP may be a slight annoyance, but it won't compare to trying to manufacture your own opt-out records from logs later on. That's gonna be a lot more painful. And so implementing a CMP up front is gonna save you time. Finally, you sh should expect a monetization impact. It's hard to predict the ultimate results, but this is something that you should be prepared for. CPMs, the cost per metric for personalized ads, 
where a bid request contains some sort of identifier, like a cookie ID, monetize on average two to three times higher than a bid request that does not have one. So for all your California traffic, expect some sort of effect. Next, for the advertisers, many of the same issues apply. And that's because many advertisers are actually publishers of their own websites. So all of those things are true. But more importantly, if you are doing your own advertising and running your own ad campaigns, I think you need to actually be even more careful with your transfers of data that could be marked as a sale. It's a lot more nuanced. For example, if you have a targeting or marketing list that you're passing to a vendor for an offline conversion, that could be a sale. Likewise, if you use audience matching tools, you need to consider the data flows carefully to understand what your vendor is doing, and that could constitute a sale too. Second, if you are doing what many advertisers do, which is update your targeting list live with information in a data management platform with your ad campaign data, such as the conversion data, that could be considered a sale of data. Also know that if publishers are trying very hard to restrict what can be done with personal data today, you should expect that you may not have the ability to update or, or augment your targeting list with that sort of bid data. Now, the main issue that I'd mentioned earlier is everyone needs to tackle the concept of a sale of data. Unlike most other attorneys, I tend to shy away from putting dense statutory text on slides and just reading them to the audience. It's not very engaging. But this is one of those times that I'm doing it because it's important to read that language very carefully because of its very broad drafting. Under the CCPA, a sale means selling, renting, disclosing, disseminating, making available, transferring, or otherwise communicating orally in writing or by electronic or other means, a consumer's personal information to another business or third party for monetary or other quote unquote valuable consideration. So let's apply this to what happens in behavioral advertising. Publishers pass bid requests and the bid requests will contain, often contain data such as a mobile device ID, an IDFA or AAID, an IP address, maybe precise geolocation data or a user ID or cookie ID of some sort. That data is passed down from the SSP through an exchange to a DSP, which is sometimes then passed to an agency or advertiser data management platform. And then a derivative version in a bid response is sent from the DSP to the SSP to the publisher. I already said that personal data makes each bid request much more valuable. And so if you think about it, each participant in the chain, such as the SSP or the DSP, charges a fee or take rate on this bid request. So if the CPMs are higher per bid request, each ad tech partner is actually making more money and taking a higher cut when personal data is attached. I don't know about you, but to me, that sounds a lot like some sort of value is being transferred and valuable consideration is a sale of data. So you may be thinking to yourself, you know what, Thomas, I hear you. I hear you loud and clear, but I got you covered. All of my ad tech partners, like my SSPs, are going to have to sign this fun data processing addenda that says you're a service provider. Well, first, I'm going to just tell you, number one, you're going to still have to update your privacy policy and give notice to consumers about who your service providers are. So I don't think you actually save yourself that much reputational risk. At best, at best, you've avoided the dreaded button of shame. Second, and more importantly, does signing that agreement really make your partner a service provider? A service provider has to contractually agree to not only use data as has to agree to only use data as necessary to perform the business purpose and not the service provider's own purposes. The attorney general's draft guidelines give a little bit more leeway for a service provider to use data for internal purposes, but clearly restricts data from being used to augment or clean or enhance another data set. And so you might think, look, Thomas, the attorney general says I can use it for internal business purposes. My partners are gonna do that. That's not so bad. Uh, and I'm gonna have to just say, maybe it's not so bad, but maybe 
you haven't really thought through what's going on in the back end. So what's happening there on the back end? As for SSPs and DSPs to interoperate, at least one of them will have to do a cookie or user ID sync. And that means that one of them is maintaining a match table. Each time a match table is, is updated, that's an augmentation of a data source. Oh wait, SSPs and DSPs can't do that, can they, as service providers? Unfortunately, they do. And if they didn't, they would have to strip the personal data and you should expect your monetization to drop. DSPs are also being pushed to be service providers of advertisers and agencies who themselves like to claim ownership of all their bid response data. So if they are trying to update their data, such as their targeting list, when they do it, that would constitute a transfer of data, which they've used for their own purposes, and therefore is a sale. This happens. So even though SSPs like Pubmatic place restrictions on DSPs, this happens, and so do even worse things, such as buyers building audience segments that they should not be building. This is reality. And so if you think that you can just pass liability to service providers by making them sign a contract, the reality is you can't. You cannot pass liability to service providers if you have reason to know that data is going to be misused. And I'm going to tell you right now that it happens. It, it may not happen that often, but it does. So consider yourselves educated. And that also means that you are not able to rely on that service provider exemption to wash your hands and avoid liability. And I haven't even gotten into the use of fraud providers like White Ops or a matching service like LiveRamp. All of that is likely a sale and falls outside of what a service provider can do because of how their services are architected and what they're doing with that data. And so my bottom line for all of you is that for behavioral advertising, the service provider distinction does not work. That is Pubmatic's position, as well as that of many data privacy experts. It's also the position of the IAB. Many of you may have already heard about the IAB limited service provider framework. And while no framework is perfect, such as the fact that there are competing mechanisms from both the IAB and the DAA, I will be upfront and say that I think the IAB framework is the closest to legal reality. And that's why we at Pubmatic are signatories. So why do I like it? As I mentioned, it, create, it recognizes that targeted advertising is a sale. Publishers and other ad tech providers who worked on the framework, including Pubmatic, understood that clearly. It also creates a truly workable service provider solution. When an SSP, a DSP, and even a buyer are all signatories, each bid request that is opted out is removed from that contractual mess that exists between publisher to SSP, advertiser to DSP, SSP to DSP, and everything that happens in between that will destroy that service provider status because everyone agrees to be removed from that architecture to be a subservice provider to the IAB and the IAB alone. Finally, it creates certainty around what uses of data are actually okay and which ones aren't. And so for example, creating audience segments is never okay. And the IAB LSPA, the Limited Service Provider Agreement, has granular information on what is and is not allowed. So at the end of the day, I encourage everyone to sign on to the framework. Circulating your own data protection agenda with conflicting ideas of what a service provider can do is number one, false. Number two, it's unworkable for DSPs who can't understand what they're receiving from an SSP and process that in a real time bidding transaction. And number three, it does not really ultimately protect you. So with that, I'll pass it off to Ash Vemopali, who can describe a little bit more about how the IAB framework works technically. Thanks a lot, Thomas. That was super insightful. Um, I hope everyone on the call um, understood the legal implications of CCPA. What I, uh, what I plan to do now is give a high-level overview of how the CCPA information flows through the supply chain what are all the key parts that are highlighted in CCPA? Walk through some examples and highlight how Google open bidding is different within an exchange ecosystem. So let me start off with 
an opt-out signal flow and how it works. I'll start from the publisher page. Consumer visits a publisher property and he does see a do not sell button. He would have two options, whether to opt out or not to do anything. In either case, the CMP that's available on the publisher property generates a US privacy string and that privacy string can be accessed by an SSP through an US privacy string API. So the code that sits on the publisher page extracts the user preferences and sends that information to Exchange. The Exchange parses the US privacy string and make, makes the relevant decision whether to transact on that bid request or not. There are a couple of options available when an user has opted out. Exchanges have problematic decided to drop all user requests where a consumer has opted out of targeted advertising. The other option is to strip out the personal information and send it down to DSP. The DSP can decide to bid on the bid request with minimal information, but at this point, we thought that there is little value in sending those bid requests, so we are dropping the bid request where the user has decided to opt out. We'll continuously monitor the opt-out rate of different publishers, and we will take subsequent action of stripping the personal information in future. So now with that said, I will move on to the details of IAB specifications. So IAB, when they release the technical specifications for CCPA, it has three primary pillars. The first and foremost is a privacy string. Uh, it captures the preference of the users. The second component there is um, a signature for capturing the user's signal API. Any entity that sits in the path of monetizing bid requests can use this standardized API to extract the user preference and share it to downstream entities. And the final component of this specification is once the information is extracted from the publisher, how does it flow through OpenRTB? So those are the three primary pillars, a US privacy string, API to access the privacy string, and how, that, how does the data that's captured by the API send through all the partners that are participating on the bid request. Now, moving on to the first element, US privacy string. Uh, unlike GDPR, CCPS US privacy string is very simple, as simple as it can get. It's a string of four characters, and what I'm going to walk through is what each of the character means. The first character in, in um, CCPA is a specification version. It will always be one because we are just rolling out the first version. In future, when there is an update to this version, this number can go to two or three. And the reason for this version management is for um, different systems to process the specification by its version. The second character in the privacy string is explicit notice. What does it mean? It means whether the user has been given uh, a notice explicitly or not. This information enables exchanges and DSPs to understand whether this publisher is compliant or whether he has tools in place to collect the consent management. Character three in the US privacy string captures the user preference this is the most important character in this string according to me. What it captures is whether the user has opted out of targeted advertising or opted out of um, uh, do not sell. So users' um, bid requests where opt out sale has been marked as yes would be dropped out. This is, these are the requests where users are explicitly saying, I don't want any targeted advertising. The final character in the US privacy spring is LSPA cover transaction. 
what it captures is whether the publisher is part of IAB's limited service providers agreement. So that's all um, at a very high level, four characters that capture the user pref preferences and publisher readiness for CCPA. And uh, all of that together is, is captured in US privacy stream. So what I would do now is walk through a few examples of how this US privacy string could look and what it means. Example one is a US privacy string which has one, why, no, no. What does it mean? Uh, as I have told earlier, for all uh, reasonable purposes, we can ignore the first character for now because we're all on version one. So now how would I interpret Example one, this is how I'm going to interpret. Yes, the publisher has given explicit notice. User did not opt out of sale, means he, he's fine with targeted advertising. Third, the publisher is not part of LSPA. I will process that information and take relevant action uh, within the SSP environment. DSP would do the same thing. Now I'll move on to example two. In this case, the user did not provide explicit notice, but by some mechanism, he has identified that user has opted out and he's still not part of LSPA. That's example two. Example three, in this case, the signal said, we don't know whether the publisher has provided explicit notice or not, but the user has opted out of sale, and we don't know whether they're part of LSPA. Actually, example three, the information is sufficient for Pubmatic to drop that request because it's explicitly, uh, user has explicitly opted out of sale. Example four, we don't have any information, so we would assume that user has not opted out. So circling back to what Thomas has said earlier, for CCPA to come into play, users have to explicitly opt out. Until then, we assume that the user is interested in targeted advertising. So those are some of the examples of how CCPA can manifest within the bid request. My final topic on hand today is how is Google open bidding handling CCPA? Google has took a stand where if the user, if the public has turned on regulated data processing, then Google would monetize all the bid requests only within their ecosystem. They're not going to even send opt out requests to any bidders or demand partners. What's the consequence of this? Any additional bidders that are integrated into open bidding, they won't see any opt-out requests at all. So that makes all the publishers complying for CCPA without publishers doing anything explicitly. So that's the final caveat I want everyone to be aware of so you can take relevant actions on your end. With that, I would pass this on to Jawad Toli, who will walk you guys through how a CMP comes into play and how the integration looks like. Back to you, Thank Toli. You. Thank you, Ash, for this uh, deep dive into the IAB CCPA framework. I am Jawad Toli, I'm the CTO at the content management platform Didomi, and I'm very excited to be here today with Pubmatic to talk about CCPA and concept management platforms. I know the IAB CCPA framework is complicated to understand and implement for publishers, so I wanted to show how CMPs, concept management platforms, can help you integrate the IAB CCPA framework easily and get in compliance with the CCPA regulation. To get started, I will walk you through lessons and key takeaways from GDPR in the EU and how you can leverage that experience when implementing CCPA. And then I will also talk about 
what a CMP like the Domi is and how it works and how you can effectively use it to easily implement the IBC CPA framework we have covered and getting compliance with CCPA. So let's dive in. So GDPR was adopted about three years ago in the EU and has seen an industry-wide adoption since then. It's obviously a regulation, but previous regulations were partly ignored. Um, enforcement was key in making sure that GDPR was adopted by European publishers and advertisers, and enforcement was heavy for GDPR by local data protection authorities. So we have seen the biggest publishers adopt it and implement the IABTCF, which is the Transparency and Content Framework, a framework by the IAB Europe equivalent to the CCPA framework here in the US. The TCF has been key in standardizing the way content is collected in Europe and the way it is shared between publishers, vendors, and advertisers. It has also been driving um, the adoption by publishers of the regulation by making sure that there was a simple standard in place for that. What we've also seen in Europe is that there has been an impact from GDPR on CPMs and revenue of publishers. Initially, there was no change as the ad tech stack was slowly getting in compliance but eventually over time, and specifically in the last six to 12 months, we have seen that CPMs and revenue from non-compliant inventory has started going down. Whereas on the other hand, as Thomas mentioned before, the revenue from compliant inventory, updating inventory was going up as it was driving more value for advertisers and DSPs. And then what we have also seen in Europe is that regulations, even when they are adopted at a high level, end up being local and always evolving. In Europe in particular, while the GDPR is a European regulation, we do see local enforcement and local recommendations issued by local data protection authorities. And we do see a fragmented environment where big publishers have to be in compliance with every single country that they operate in. From this experience with GDPR, we can see a few key takeaways for CCPA here in the US. The first one is that there will likely be a massive adoption of the US, uh, the CCPA framework from the IB that has already started from us vendors, and we're already seeing a lot of publishers adopting it. And we definitely expect this IABC CPA framework to play the same role as the TCF in Europe, which is becoming the centralized and standardized way of collecting user choices with respect to do not sell and sharing that user choice with vendors across the whole ad tech stack. It is also likely, as mentioned by Thomas, that there will be an impact on CPMs and revenue. That being said, the impact is likely to be lower than what we have seen in Europe because CCPA is an opt-out based uh, model in that case, implying that there will be a higher opt-in rate from users and there will be a lower impact on publishers' operations. And then finally, we can also expect more US regulations to fall at some point um, maybe at the state level, maybe at the federal level, but most likely there will be other iterations on similar regulations throughout the country. Now with that covered, I wanted to discuss what a content management platform is and how they can help getting in, comp in compliance with uh, the CCPA. Content management platforms uh, is, are companies that were created around three years ago with the GDPR wave in Europe to help, complaints, to help compliance with data privacy regulations. The DOMI in particular was founded in 2017 and we focus on collecting, storing, and sharing user choices, both constants in Europe, but also do not sell choices here in the US for ad tech publishers, advertisers, um, anyone who has to deal with CCPA basically. 
And the role of a CMP is to do three things. The first one is collect the user choices to display UI elements like the notice that was mentioned before to help publishers inform the user and also allow users to express their choices. So allow them to opt in into the cell of information or to opt out from that cell. Then CMPs will store that information, store that user choice to keep a legal proof of how the user was informed and what the user choice was. And we usually keep uh, that proof at the publisher level. So we will be keeping history of what was displayed to users as a whole. And we'll also keep specific proof for every user that might have made a choice for a specific publisher. And then CMPs are also in charge of sharing the user choices with vendors, implementing the TCA finger up the CCPA framework in the US to make sure that vendors on a specific web page or mobile app are informed of the user choice and automatically ensuring that the ad requests are compliant with the local regulations. So CMPs will determine what the user location is, what regulation applies, ensure that the correct UI is surfaced, and then ensure that vendors are in form of the user choices. CMPs are pretty easy to deploy usually. They work just like your other partners and vendors. You will get a small piece of code to deploy on your website or on your mobile app that you will be able to embed just like your regular tags. And then CMPs will automatically start interacting with the user and vendors. And I will walk you through a small platform integration to show you how that would work with the dome. Um, the last two items that I think are very interesting to keep in mind as a publisher when you are going to adopt a CMP is the common pitfalls and the common issues you will encounter when getting in compliance with CCPA. The first one is around UI and messaging. CMPs like Domi have standard user interfaces that will make you compliant. But it's important for you as publishers to also own those interactions with users. You want to make sure you are configuring and adapting all the, messa all the messaging, the look and feel of the CMPs to make sure that the end result is fully customized to your usual brand experience. Um, and that's something that you want to invest time in. That is the usually the CMP and the notice, the CCPA notice that will be displayed is one of the first things that a user will see on a website. So you want to make sure that it is highly customized. The second item that is important to keep in mind is the integrations with vendors. What is really important under CCPA is that vendors get the information from the CMP. The good news is that with vendors like CMP and with the IABC CPA framework, that is mostly automated, where most of your advertising-related vendors will get that status from the CMP automatically without you having to do anything as a publisher. Some vendors that are not participating into the IABC CPA framework will require extra work and extra integrations from publishers and CMPs. Google Ad Manager is a very typical example we see all the time. So Vidomi has a custom integration with them at this point. But we also see a lot of other types of vendors like analytics and social. And so depending on whether they are service providers or not, you might need to also make sure that they are correctly subject to the user choice under CCP. So those are the main two items that are usually requiring a little bit more time and resources on your side when you're deploying a CMP to get in compliance. And now I wanted to walk you through a typical CMP deployment for creating a do not sell notice that will be interacting with the CCPA framework and making sure that you are in compliance with CCPA. So I'm going to be sharing my screen to show you what a typical deployment looks like with a CMP like Didomi. So with Didomi, you're able to manage multiple what we call consent notices, which is all those UI elements that you will be surfacing to the user. Um, we'll take an example here with a CCPA demo consent notice, where you can decide what platform you're creating the notice for. We currently support websites, AMP websites, and mobile applications. And then you can also decide the regulations that you want to cover with your notice. Uh, we currently support GDPR and CCPA, 
and will automatically determine the user location, the regulation that applies, and what notice needs to be surfaced to the user. So you can manage all your regulations with a single notice if you want to. So keeping CCPA enabled here, you're able to then configure all the look and feel of your content notice. So you can choose what you want it to look like, what the color should be, what the text should be. You can edit all your standard text that are offered, um, and making sure that it's very customized to how you operate as a company. Um, there are a lot of other customization options, but you end up getting a sort of tag that you can then use and deploy on your website to make sure that the content notice starts appearing on your website. And this embed code here, this tag, is a very standard one. So it can be embedded either as a through your tag manager or as a regular tag on your web page. So deployment is effectively very easy from that perspective. Once this tag has been deployed to your website, you will start seeing the notice, the CCPA notice appearing, the do not sell notice appearing. An example here on newsweek.com of a very simple notice informing the user of their right to opt out of the sale of data under CCPA for a user that would be located in California. And then this also gives the user options to get more information by getting a more detailed information on how CCP operates and what the rights are under CCPA, as well as having this do not sell button here that can be used by the user to enable do not sell to opt out from the sale of their personal data. And that's the button that basically starts sharing the user choice with vendors, informing them that the user has opted out from their personal data, or on the contrary, that they haven't. And as Ash described, the standard workflow for a user is to see the notice, get the option to either get more information and enable do not sell, or simply acknowledge the notice, potentially ignore it, and then on the next page, the notice will disappear and the user will be opted in into the cell of personal data. And that's why I was mentioning that the opt-out rate is effectively pretty low in situations like this, potentially lower than 1%, where most users are accepting the cell of their personal data under CCPA. Another small piece of information that is important to keep in mind is the option for the user to change their mind later on. So you also want to update your privacy policy to give the user an option to enable or disable, do not sell there. Having the same workflow can be re-enabled from your privacy policy. And that will put you in compliance with the uh, US privacy IABC CPA framework, basically. And then the last step in this deployment is to test a little bit. So for IAB vendors like Pubmatic, you usually uh, can double check whether the US privacy string is correctly being passed. And for non-IAB vendors, you'll want to double check how you decide to load them or to embed them on your website based on the user choices. And as mentioned, all the deployment is done through your usual tools, so your tag managers or directly through your website. And it works the same for mobile environments. So it's pretty straightforward across all environments. And so to end this, I just wanted to um, summarize how CMPs aid compliance. The idea is that as a publisher, you're perfectly free to do all of that yourself. And we've seen publishers build their own notices, build their own integrations with the CCPA framework. And if you're comfortable doing that, I think it's a perfectly acceptable choice. What we do see though as a CMP, and obviously it being our only focus, um, is that it gets complicated over time to maintain those notices, to maintain different regulations, to maintain evolution of those regulations. And so it makes sense to work with a commercial CMP like the Domi to automatically share the CCPA and do not sell status with vendors, and also always stay up to date with frameworks and regulations. So thanks a lot for listening to me today. Um, I will, uh, any question around CCPA or the Domi, feel free to reach out to me personally or go to our website and we'll be happy to help you get started and get in compliance. Um, and now I think Marina wanted to share some resources on how to learn more about CCPA and start getting in compliance. 
Thank you, Jawad, and really appreciate you taking the time to join us today for this webinar and sharing um, all the CMP side of compliance and, and how CMPs fit in this picture. So a brief note on resources. Uh, you can find some additional resources always at the Pomatic community site. We have a CCPA page um, where we'll always keep that up to date with our viewpoint on CCPA and compliance with Pomatic. Uh, the IAB CCPA page is always a great stopping point for an overview, and you can see the framework as well on the IAB website. Uh, Pomatic as a whole, you know, you all work with customer success managers on your accounts if you're a publisher. And um, that's always a great place to go as well for follow-up questions. Um, and lastly, you can, of course, go to our overall websites, pubmatic.com or didomi.io for um, follow-up with uh, either of us. Uh, and all of these links are also available on the left-hand side of the uh, webinar software. So with that, I want to turn to some questions. Um, we've gotten a few questions written in, and um, feel free to add more as they come in. So one general question that came through is, will a recording of the, section, the session excuse me, and the presentation deck be made available? And the answer to that is both yes. So stay posted on email. Um, we will send that as a follow-up, both the recording and the presentation itself. So one second question we got in that I'd like to take up first, what did the law say regarding California residents um, while they're visiting New York, as an example? Does the CCPA apply to them as well? And if not, do you think it's the main reason why it would expand to the rest of the US as well? Um, so I'll pass that question on to Thomas to take the first pass. Thanks, Marina. So I. I I think it's a great question, and the reality is the California law only exempts outside of information collected outside of California in some very limited circumstances. And so generally speaking, I think uh, if you were to take a, a rather conservative approach, uh, the conservative approach would be to opt out all, link, all traffic for the United States, and that's what some publishers are doing. The reason I say that is because the statute itself defines the conditions uh, for which uh, for, for which a any anyone can consider something a sale or not a sale that happens within California and so the the key the key provision is that um, the CCPA does not apply if the collection or sale uh, if every aspect of that commercial conduct takes place wholly outside of California and it's hard to determine whether the whole thing took place out of California or not you don't know necessarily where the data centers were. For example, I think most companies maintain two data centers in the US. They'll maintain one on the East Coast, one on the West Coast. And if they have that sort of split and it passes through the California data center, you're gonna have a hard time arguing that that traffic shouldn't be covered. Uh, I think publishers are taking a risk-based approach to this. And so I know a number of them are only opting out and geofencing California traffic uh, with the hope that uh, the attorney general will still view that as a, a step for proper compliance, uh, even if it's not 100% perfect. And others are saying that they should just apply it to all of their US traffic or even all of their international traffic. Uh, that's something I think you should consult counsel with. Um, I can say that at Pubmatic, how we're responding to uh, uh, a, a, a ad request that contains the proper LSPA string, uh, the US privacy string, which is opted out, um, we will honor that even outside of California. So we're taking a more conservative approach with that. Perfect. Perfect. Thank you, Thomas. Thank you, Thomas. Uh, the first uh, question we've got, got here, here, and Thomas will just Thomas ask you to go on mute so we don't hear background. Thank you. Uh, the LSPA allows for limited downstream processing of personal information after a do not sell request. But if it makes more sense for SSPs to drop the low value bid request, and so as a result, stop processing the opted out personal information, what's the benefit to signing on to the LSPA? Um, so Thomas, I'll pass this back to you. Sure, so the LSPA, as I've mentioned, defines uh, certain categories that uh, can or can't be used. And um, one of the permissible uses is for 
um, selecting basic ads as well as uh, selecting targeted or personalized ads. And so uh, if the traffic is opted out, the DSP can still receive it and serve a personalized advertising advertisement. Now that does not mean that um, the DSP can then do other things with that data, but it's that personalized ad aspect that allows CPMs to be higher. Uh, and so that what would become what would be considered a low value bid request or, or low value impression uh, will should maintain the same or close to the same amount of monetization as a fully personalized advertise, ad, advertisement that would uh, accompany a sale of the data. That's great, Thomas. Uh, let me add on one more point. Um, I think the reason, I think there is great value in LSPA. We are not discounting LSPA, but the timelines around which the enforcement came into play um, made it um, necessary for us to simplify the opt-out mechanism and protect the publisher interests, which is why we went out for, and decided to drop out the request. We will continue to monitor how the opt-out rates are. As the adoption increase and as more people opt out, that's when um, processing the bid requests with limited personal information would become far more important. Until that moment arrives, we will be dropping out the opt-out request. I hope that answers the question, Tony. Perfect. Thank you, Tyson Ash. So another question we've got, is it mandatory to sign on to the IAB LSPA even if tech-wise the publisher is compliant with CCPA overall? And Ash, I'll pass this one to you. So um, I'll, pitch in my, I'll pitch in my thoughts and then I'll pass it on to Thomas. No, um, actually it's not mandatory for everyone to sign on to LSPA. It just simplifies the process of managing these contractual obligations between multiple vendors. Without an LSPA, you have to manage this explicitly with all the vendors, not just your direct vendors, but also indirect vendors with whom your direct vendors would be working on. This would all of a sudden becomes a nightmare for everyone who wants to manage. So we do appreciate the presence of LSPA and how much it simplifies the whole workflow for ad tech industry. Thomas, do you want to add anything? I do. Um, I'll say a couple of things. I think first, there are going to be partners in the ad tech ecosystem that will parse the LSP lang LSPA language very carefully. And uh, for those that do, um, they will check to see if the source of the bid request is part of the LSPA. They're gonna see if the recipient of the bid request is part of the LSPA. And if, neither, if either one of those isn't true, then they have the ability to uh, to, to, to figure out what they want to do with that data at that point and to pass it on or not. And so it, it, it leaves some uh, it leaves some gray, gray room or wiggle room. Uh, and uh, I think a more conservative approach is just, such as what we're taking in Pubmatic is to just go ahead and uh, honor that traffic. But that's not always going to be the case. And so it's very hard for you to rely on that signal and still claim that everyone is going to be your service provider if you don't know if, if you don't know that every recipient is actually going to be compliant with the IMARC in the same exact manner. It also is possible to comply with the CCPA without being part of the IAB framework. So I don't want to say that the IAB framework means that uh, that is your one-stop shop for compliance. Uh, for example, it's, it's possible to go ahead and put a do not sell my information button and to acknowledge that all, bid, all personalized advertising that happens on your site is a sale, and then to opt out through a different mechanism and just drop personal information. That will be a completely 100% compliant way of, uh, of working with the CCPA and not having to deal with the IAB framework. Um, where the IAB framework helps is that uh, it gives us the ability 
uh, it gives each ad tech partner the ability in a limited fashion to still serve personal items advertising when uh, they would normally be prohibited from doing so once a user has opted out. And so that's why it gives a, a, it will give an enhanced monetization boost in a very tightly defined uh, compliance framework. Perfect. Thank you both for that answer. Uh, another question we've gotten. Will COVID-19 situation have any effect on the timing of CCPA enforce date? So Thomas, I'll pass this back to you again. Sure. So um, many industry groups have asked the Attorney General's office to delay enforcement. And while the Attorney General has not uh, released any sort of written guidance, um, in an interview, the office did indicate that they would like to still continue enforcement on July 1st. There are some things happening on the regulatory side that may delay it uh, with, in terms of uh, the time frame that is required for another regulatory body to review the guidelines for enforcement by the Attorney General's office. But uh, at the end of the day, uh, the AG has said that, they, that he would like to enforce on July 1, and so I think that's the date that we have to take somewhat seriously. Thanks, Thomas. I will add on a relevant point, but not specifically to CCPA. Um, I know most of you guys are also thinking about transitioning to TCF 2.0, for which IABUU has set a deadline of uh, June 1st. Uh, we got an updated communication on that just yesterday, stating that they are shifting um, the readiness of CMPs and vendors um, to be, I think, June, I think it's May 30. They are shifting the dates by um, 30 days for all the vendors to become ready for TCF 2.0. But the overall guidance by IABEU for GDPR still remains intact. They want the industry to transition to GDPR 2.0 by June 1st. I know it's a side topic, but I thought most of you would be interested in knowing about how the timelines for TCF 2.0 are also shifting. Back to you, Marina. Perfect, thank you, that was great. Appreciate both sides of this. Uh, one more question we've got. What is the meaning of privacy laws in the post third party cookie era? Uh, Ash, do you wanna take a first pass at this? Yes. Again, in my view, um, it's everything is like quite hazy right now, but this is my personal view. Um, in a world where we will not have third-party cookies, um, there will be a new way to identify users. My belief is the whole privacy loss would be tailored to latch on to that new way of identifying users and honoring the user preferences to that new identity. Um, that would be a whole slew of changes that would follow once the standardization of identifying users uh, happen in a post-cookie world. Then um, most industry would be relying on cookies uh, in, in the web uh, traffic. And in case of in-app traffic, users would be latching on to the IDFA and ADIDs. So that's my view. And Ash, to, to add on to that, the cookies are just one example of personal data, especially in Europe. Um, so the regulation really applies to a lot more than just cookies. So not having third-party cookies is not really essential in the regulation. Where it has a big impact is on being able to store the user choices. So whereas the user privacy is comprised of a lot more than cookies themselves, we rely on cookies a lot to be able to know what the user choices were. So there is going to be a user experience impact in terms of how those notices are displayed and how often they're displayed. So that's one thing where the impact will be important and that we will need to find solutions around. Perfect. And Thank you, Ash. As well, um, I think the reality of is that privacy laws are still going to be relevant and at the end of the day, what Joao was just saying uh, is true. And that's because each of the privacy laws is almost always defined to uh, govern the use of whatever is quote unquote personal data or PII or some sort of term like that. 
And the terms are, draft, are broadly drafted to mean uh, information that can be related or, or uh, identified back to a particular individual or device or household even. And that's a pretty broad data set. And so just having the cookie ID go away uh, doesn't mean that privacy compliance is going to become any less complex. And I also think that privacy laws will adapt to whatever the new identifiers or new ways of, of, of tracking users happens to be. Um, I think the CCPA generally was pretty reactive uh, to how things are being done today. The, uh, the CPRA, which is uh, perhaps going to be on the ballot uh, or not in November, depending on whether Alistair McTaggart can get enough signatures, uh, is going to modify things further. And that could take an effect in about 2023. Uh, and of course, there could be further laws that continue on to monitor the ad tech industry. So I think uh, the importance of privacy law compliance is only going to increase, and the complexity will as well. Perfect. So one of many steps we'll be taking over a period of time, no doubt. <laughs> Uh, so we are at time. I want to be mindful if you have to log out and you have a meeting after this, but we got one last question that I do want to take because I know this will apply to many of you. We got this question. If I'm working with Google OB, are there any scenarios that make me non-compliant? Thomas, do you want to quickly hit on that? And Ash, you may have something to add to. I think generally the answer is no. Um, restricted data processing within Google's ad manager and how open bidding works is uh, pretty comprehensive. Uh, there are two ways that it works. One is that it can uh, strip personal data completely, uh, and, uh, and how that works is it will actually keep everything within Google's own ecosystem. Um, of course, that's not the preference in that Pubmatic has in terms of your implementation. Uh, and the second is to apply the uh, contextual advertising and stripping out of data uh, and restricted data processing only to the California opted out traffic. And uh, at that point, SSPs such as Pubmatic that are plugged into open bidding will only receive that traffic that is already opted in. Yeah, um, adding on to what Thomas has just said, um, we do recommend you guys to sync up with uh, ad manager account teams. But so far, as far as our understanding goes, um, the publisher would be in compliance um, if they are activating traffic through Google OB. So they have provided two provisions, as far as I know. One, actually for publishers who does not even want to support do not sell. If you are a publisher like that, can just choose to monetize everything within the Google ecosystem, but obviously that would have a monetization impact. The other alternative that Google provides is you choose to implement do not sell button and send signal to Google ad manager. And for opt-out traffic, Google would monetize only within their ecosystem. Overall, for EB, for a partner like Pomatic, we will, by default, come into compliance. Um, and that is something that I want all of you guys to be aware of. Perfect. Thank you all. Um, I want to be mindful of time. We, we will wrap up right now. But as a reminder, um, we will send out the recording of the webinar as well as the presentation as well. Um, appreciate you all joining us and paying attention. Hopefully you found this useful and you all left with um, an increased understanding of CCPA and how to work towards compliance. Um, and as always, Pubmatic and Dudomi are here for any questions that come in the future. Thank you, Marina. Thank you, everyone. Thank you.